All right, good morning my and welcome to the research forum. My name is George Orling. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm the Senior Director of Mission and Scientific Affairs at HDSA. We're really in for a treat this morning. Um, I hope that you're going to learn a lot and most importantly, go home with feel a feeling of hope and energy of all the tremendous amount of research that's going on around the world to combat Huntington's disease. Our goal in crafting this agenda for this weekend's research presentations really was to provide you with a clear and inspiring picture of the worldwide landscape of our HD research drug development. Yesterday we heard from researchers from Santa Fe Genzyme as well as Wave Life Sciences on their plans to bring innovative Huntington lowering therapies to patients. Later this afternoon, you're going to hear about exciting approaches being developed for HD by Annexon Biosciences as well as CHDI Foundation at a new therapies, potential new therapies workshop at 1.15. Uh, but this morning, we're really honored to have the two chief scientists um, from the NINDS and CHDI Foundation to speak about what they're doing to tackle HD. These are the two largest supporters of HD research, research in the world. First, we're going to hear from uh, just, just go through the agenda. This is, we're going to hear from Dr. Walter Koroshitz, who's the director of the National Institute of Ni Neurologic Disorders and Stroke, or the NINDS. Next, Dr. Robert Pacifici, the chief scientific officer of CHDI Foundation, is going to share an overview of CHDI and, some of, and highlight some of the current activities they have underway towards achieving their mission, which is rapidly developing therapeutics to slow the progression of Huntington's disease. And finally, I think all of us I can speak for are, are going to be excited to wrap up the research forum with a really entertaining presentation from Dr. Ed Wild and Dr. Jeff Carroll, where they're um, they're going to provide you an update as to where what have we learned and where have we progressed since they were last on the stage uh, a year ago in Dallas. HDSA believes that the um, it's really our responsibility to ensure that the pipeline of young researchers is full. No matter what the future brings, we need to make sure that there are young clinicians, passionate young scientists in the community that are going to be working on HD for years to come. And I'm happy to um, announce that uh, in the past years we've invited our Don King Summer Research Fellows to join us and give poster presentations to the community and once again we've invited them to join us here. They're sitting in the front. Um, we've got uh, Patrick Hogan from Rush Medical College. Patrick is here. Patrick are you here? Can you stand up? Patrick. We've got Rogan Grant from Haverford College. I know Rogan's right here. And Brianna Bible, I know is here, She's from St. Mary's College in California. So after uh, Dr. Pacifici's talk, we'll have a short break, but go out into the exhibit hall where the coffee is, grab a cup of coffee, and let these uh, really young, great scientists, aspiring young scientists, walk you through their posters. This program, we're just happy to announce that we've just awarded the 2016 Summer Research Fellowships. Um, they're not with us today because hopefully they're all in their home labs working on HD while we're here having fun. But we're happy to announce that the 2016 winners are Lance Heady from the University of Iowa, Danny Berge from Montana State, who's going to be working actually at the Institutes of Systems Biology in Seattle, Washington, and Juwan Zhang, who is a student at the University of Pennsylvania, should be working at a Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Um, so stick around after Ed and Jeff's presentation. We'll clean up the room a little bit. We're going to be bringing in box lunches. There is such thing. It is a free lunch. Um, so grab a lunch, sit down, and uh, what we've brought to you are, are the uh, scientists from the, some of the pharmaceutical and biotech companies that are actually running clinical trials, and they're going to be here to speak to you about, give you updates about their trials, and answer your questions. So we're going to hear from uh, David Stamler, who's going to lead off, talking about the latest press release and the news coming out of Teva and the FDA. Um, Ed Wild's going to give an overview of uh, CHGI's Enroll HD program. Uh, Mike Brownstein is going to be talking about the STAIR trial from Azavan Pharmaceuticals. John Leonard is here from Vasinex to talk about their SIGNAL trial. Ed is going to come back. I'm really uh, 
uh, appreciative. He, he was, uh, uh, they're gonna let, Ionis is letting Ed present an update on the exciting Ionis uh, Huntington lowering study. And finally, I'll wrap up with a way to get involved uh, through our HDSA's HD trial finder. After you've heard about all of this information about uh, clinical trials, it's a really great way to uh, get your information and get involved. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to our esteemed chairman of the board, Dr. Jung Ho Cha, to introduce our first speaker. Thanks, George. It's my extreme pleasure to be able to introduce my friend and mentor, Dr. Walter Koroshetz. Walter Koroshetz was selected director of the NINDS, which is the National Institutes for Neurological Disorders and Stroke, and yes, there will be a quiz, in June of 2015. Dr. Koroshetz joined NINDS in 2007 as deputy director, and he served as acting director from October 2014 through June of 2015. Uh, he had served as deputy director of NINDS under Dr. Story Landis. Together, they directed program planning and budgeting, oversaw the scientific and administrative functions of the institute. He has held leadership roles in a number of NIH and NINDS programs, including the NIH's Brain Initiative, the Traumatic Brain Injury Center collaborative effort between the NIH Intramural Program and the Uniformed Health Services University, and the multi-year work to develop and establish the NIH Office of Emergency Care Research to coordinate NIH emergency care research and research training. Before joining NINDS, Dr. Koroshet served as Vice Chair of the Neurology Service and Director of Stroke and Neurointensive Care Services at Mass General Hospital. He was a professor of neurology at Harvard Medical School, HMS, and led neurology resident training at MGH between 1990 and 2007. Over the same period, he co-directed the HMS Neurobiology of Disease course with doc Drs. Edward Kravitz and Robert Brown, a course that I was uh, honored to um, be a lecturer in and eventually take over his role. A native of Brooklyn, New York, Dr. Korshitz graduated from Georgetown University and received his medical degree from the University of Chicago. He trained not only in internal medicine, but also in, um, in neurology uh, at University of Chicago and Massachusetts General Hospital. He did postdoctoral studies in cellular neurophysiology at, at MGH with Dr. David Corey, and later at the Harvard Neurobiology Department with Dr. Edward Fershpan, studying the mechanisms of excitotoxicity and neuroprotection. He joined the neurology staff, first in the HD unit, followed by the Stroke and Neurointensive Care Service. A major focus of his clinical research was to develop measures in patients that reflect the underlying biology of their conditions. With the MGH team, he discovered increased brain lactate in HD patients using magnetic resonance spectroscopy. He helped the team to pioneer the use of diffusion perfusion weighted MR imaging and CT angiography perfusion imaging in acute stroke. When I arrived at Mass General as a resident in neurology, not only was Walter the residency director, he was the vice chair of the department, he was the director of the stroke service, he was the director of the neurologic ICU, and he was the director of the HD unit. So clearly, <clears throat> he had a lot of time on his hands. <laughs> um, but Walter, on a personal note, really introduced me to HD. So as part of the HD unit for a year, um, I was his fellow and saw his patients with him, really learning how to take care of HD patients. And uh, Walter carted me around to various parts of New England, going to nursing homes, seeing these patients who he'd known for years. Walter's one of the founding members of the Massachusetts chapter um, uh, of HDSA and he has continued to uh, be a leader. So I think it's important for this audience to know that we have friends in high places, right? Please join me in welcoming Dr. Koroshetz to the stage to pre present his talk entitled, entitled NIH and the American Taxpayer's Investment in Neuroscience. Well, I 
I can't tell you what a great pleasure it is to be here um, uh, for lots of different reasons. One, it's always great to get out from under the beltway. And um, second of all, it's great to be back with uh, uh, persons with Huntington's and their families. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about um, the National Institutes of Health um, and, uh, and what we're doing in terms of brain research and particularly uh, try to target my remarks to what I think uh, can be some of the things uh, coming out of the NIH research that uh, can help people with Huntington's disease because that is the goal of the NIH is to really bring health to Americans and certainly people in this room and I and people take care of Huntington's patients know that you know, we certainly have a long, long, long way to go. But the good news is there's lots of good people working on the problem. So I think that's the message. And, and I think that the you know, meetings like this is where you really see that up front and center. And, uh, and I, I must say that there are, all groups are not as tightly knit and motivated as the Huntington's community. So, so you're, you're in a very special place. So NIH's mission here. <laughs> So the National Institutes of Health is basically the taxpayer's investment in, um, in health, in health research. And my institute is the taxpayer's investment in neuroscience research uh, and in diseases of the nervous system. And our mission is really this twofold mission to seek fundamental knowledge about the nature and behavior of living systems and then to apply that knowledge to enhance the health and lengthen the life and reduce illness and disability. And the people at NIH take this really seriously, these, this two-part message. And I'll explain a little bit as we go along why I think it's, it's really important to think about both of these sides really being interconnected and not separate. Um, so our mission is pretty much the same as that one, except it's based on the nervous system. And, um, and our budget is about $1.5 billion a year. So it's a substantial amount of money, for sure. And the NIH budget is about $31 billion a year. Again, a substantial investment on the part of the taxpayers. People pay taxes. This is where the money's going. And so one of the other things I hope to take you to take home is that the NIH is really trying to do the best with your money that you pay taxes for. Um, so everybody donates. and. I donate to Huntington Society of America, but everybody here also donates to me, and I appreciate that when you pay your taxes on April 15th, so continue to do that. Uh, and, and I'll show you how we use that money. So what we try to do is invest across the full spectrum of research. We try not to leave any area of research kind of, uh, you know, under any cover, they, you, so, so that a scientist with a good idea can come in and try and prosecute that idea no matter what area of research they're in. Um, and I want to tell you that the research kind of spans a spectrum from very basic research, trying to understand how does the nervous system work, and then trying to find out how those discoveries, particularly in diseases, can be translated into therapies or diagnostic tools, and then to move those into people and to test them in people for real benefit. So that's the spectrum that we try and uh, spread our funding across. Um, and we do a lot of work trying to also bring young people, young scientists, and train them in the field. Um, and one thing that, um, that the Huntington Society can do better than we can do is, is that they can hook people on Huntington's disease. Um, once they're hooked, then we have the money to support them long term. So the people who at this table and, and uh, Hogan in the back, uh, we look forward to seeing your grants. Uh, but, I, but it's really important that we put a big emphasis on training young people, but it's really what the Huntington Society of America does to get the young people into the, that pipeline that's really, really important. And, and that's something that you can do much, much better than we can do. Um, okay, so the. The good news of that, uh, in terms of the battle that we're all trying to, to fight here, which is to get a better treatment of Huntington's disease, the good news is that the people who can help us are really kind of signing up. 
So brain science has become really hot. Uh, if you look at you know, the newspapers or the magazines, uh, the brain is, people are really interested in how the brain works. So that's good, but more importantly, people who go into science are being pulled into un trying to understand how the brain works as their major goal in life. So if you look at people coming into science now, most areas are completely flat except for brain sciences, which are going up and up and up. So the good news is that there's a really substantial workforce that's coming into play of really smart people who want to understand how the brain works and the majority of those people at some point get pulled in to try to figure out how they can use their brains to actually make a difference for people with brain diseases. Um, and that's where I think the Huntington Society comes in because you have all these people interested in brain science and you want to grab them into your area. And, and so these, these fellowships uh, that were mentioned before are really quite important. Now, from the point of view of health, it's, it's we need these people because disorders of the brain are the leading cause of disability in the US and, and in many parts of the world. Um, so what used to be the scourge of health was infectious diseases. The scourge of health in the next century is going to be brain diseases. And those are disorders, you know, like depression, uh, uh, schizophrenia, Alzheimer's disease, stroke, uh, Huntington's disease, Parkinson's disease, um, and uh, the, the other point to make is that people coming into these diseases come in from very different areas, but it's very important to know that what one person learns studying their part of the brain can have a tremendous impact on, say, Huntington's disease in a way in which you could never have predicted. So really important to get people in, stir the pot, get people to, go to get their good ideas and prosecute them because you don't know where the next breakthrough is gonna come from. If you just put all your money into Huntington's disease research, you probably go down a tunnel and you really lose a lot of, uh, of opportunity to pull something in from another area of research that really breaks open the field. So that's one thing that NIH, I think, can really do. Uh, so our spending in Huntington disease is about um, $39 million a year, but our spending in neuroscience and other diseases is one and a half billion dollars a year. And as, as I'm sure people have mentioned in previous talks, particularly the neurodegenerative diseases, there's so much overlap in the processes that, that cause the cells to die that we really think that an, an advance in any of these diseases is going to impact on the other ones as well. So we have a lot of tough problems, and I don't know if you know, that's, that's Nancy Wexler in Venezuela here in, the, in the, that right-hand uh, uh, panel. Um, so we have really tough problems. The problems that we're dealing with, as, as you all know in this room, you know, really, they're really not fair. They rob people of, of the, the life that they, they were born to have. Uh, some people are born with illnesses, they don't really ever have a chance. Um, because of their brain disorders to, to contribute, have a fulfilled life. Uh, so, uh, so this is a, uh, uh, this work, when you get somebody hooked, um, they're hooked for life because the, the draw to try and understand and make a difference in these problems um, is, is quite strong. Um, so in terms of the, your money and where is it going, uh, so this is the NIH budget over the years and um, what happened to the NIH was that about 12 years ago, uh, we came to this end of what was called the doubling. So there was a big effort on the part of Congress to increase the budget uh, to the NIH to get more discoveries coming out. And then in about 2004, that ended. And after that, the NIH budget was pretty much flat for 12 years. And uh, with inflation, you know, it wasn't big inflation, but there was some inflation. It led to about a 26% decrease in the power of, of the purchasing power of the NIH. So we have come through some periods of time where um, 
it's been quite tough on people who want to get into the field. And I mentioned for neuroscience, it's really quite unfortunate because there's so many people who want to come into neuroscience, but the money did not increase with the number of people. So it's a very competitive area right now uh, at NIH. So people at NIH, you have a chance to submit your grant, to get funding. It goes through a process of peer review. It's just like a jury. You know, when you go to trial as a jury, it's a, your grant goes to a jury, basically. And they, they, they uh, critique the grant and give it a score. And then we generally pay the best scores until we run out of money. And we usually run out of money uh, when we hit about 15% of the grants. So that means that 85% of the people who submit grants do not get funded. They can't because the competition is too tough. So it's just the top 15%. Uh, and that's another area where groups like the Huntington Society of America can make a difference with a small amount of money, keep someone going, or get them funds so that they can get preliminary data so they can get into this heavily competitive space and get grants uh, for Huntington's disease uh, based on the preliminary data that's funded by the society. Um, now, as I mentioned, the, fu the funding to, that goes out from NIH depends on who writes the grants and how good the grants are. So it's not because somebody at the top is saying, we're going to do this much research in Huntington's and this much in Parkinson's and this much in cancer. It's bottom up. It's who submits the grants, how they get scored, what are the best grants. Now, the good news for us, as I mentioned, a lot of bright people are coming into neuroscience. So what happened is, that actually pushed neuroscience above all the other buckets of funding at NIH. So this, this swelling of interest in the brain has really been, been beneficial. Even though we've had these tough years, uh, uh, the last 12 years with flat funding, uh, we were able to compete better than any other areas uh, for funding. So neuroscience is actually quite, quite healthy. But we have lots of diseases, this, I, and I can't even fit them all on here, but these are just a, a, a bunch of the diseases that our institute uh, funds research on. And as you can see, there's so many that if you just pick one and go after it, you know, your, your chances of success are quite small. So the idea is that we spread the money, multiple shots on goal, and that one disease, if we get lucky and, and make a hit in one disease, the hope is that it's going to impact on the other diseases because they're so related. Uh, now, I'm going to talk a little bit personally uh, because I think it also talks a little bit about the importance of the HDSA. Um, so my history in Huntington's, uh, as, as Chung Ho said, goes back a long time. Uh, but the story is, uh, is, is not, uh, not something that you would have predicted. Um, so as he mentioned, I had trained in neurology and I trained in, um, in medicine. And, uh, and at, I'll, later I ran into Nancy Wexler, but, um, and she was certainly a big influence in pulling me and a lot of other people into Huntington's research just by the force of her personality. Um, but the way I got into Huntington's disease uh, basically was uh, I was going to go and do basic neuroscience. I, I had a lot of background in a certain area of neuroscience, and after the residency, I wanted to go into a lab and really study that. And, um, and uh, I, I uh, thought that I would do some work with patients, because I had done quite a bit of training, but I was going to limit it to maybe a day or a half a day a week. Um, and I hadn't decided on what I was going to do. I was thinking maybe Parkinson's disease or movement disorders. And what happened was I got in the elevator, and Kung Ho knows that in the old days, the, uh, the department elevator was on the eighth floor. And so I was going from the eighth floor down to the first floor with the chairman, uh, Joe Martin, who was in the elevator. And uh, that's him. And he was a very persuasive guy. Um, so we get in the elevator, so, and he, he had this tendency to always pat people on the back. He made you feel very, very comfortable. And then you had to watch for your wallet that he didn't take your wallet. <laughs> but uh, so he passed me on about. He said, "Oh, how you doing? What are you going to do next year?" Oh, I was going to go in the lab, start working in the lab, maybe do some clinic. He said, "Oh," he said, "Oh yeah, I, I thought you were going to do Huntington's with me." I said, uh, "Sure." And then, 
the elevator door open, and I walked out the door, and that was it. And that's how I get into Huntington's disease. <laughs> so, so you got to have a good elevator story, but, but it can't be quite pronounced. So, so I worked in the laboratory, and then I went to the clinic. And the clinic was really quite spectacular. It was just beginning in those days. Um, but but uh, Ted Bird, I don't know if anybody remembers Ted Bird. Ted Bird, great. So Ted Bird was a great guy, and he was an internist, actually an endocrinologist, who got hooked on Huntington's disease, uh, particularly studying the endocrinological control in Huntington's patients. But anyway, he came to Mass General to start a clinic, because uh, he had done that in England. And then uh, Rick Myers was there, and Rick was a geneticist, and a really great guy, really devoted to Huntington's disease. And so it was really Ted and, and Rick and I uh, started seeing patients in the outpatient clinic. And then there was this other group which made things really interesting. Flint Beale and Marion Dephelia were doing research in Huntington's disease. And then Joe Martin recruited Jim Gazella to try and find the Huntington's gene. And Marcy McDonald uh, was a long-term teammate of Jim. And so this, this group was just really, really smart people. And, and really trying to go after the secret of Huntington's disease. And, uh, and my first, so I first started, and I actually took a pay cut uh, to go from a resident to a fellow in the lab. Um, and, and I started working, and my first grant was from the Huntington's Disease Society of America. So, um, so I have always been grateful to the Huntington's Disease Society of America. Um, so thank you. Because at that stage of your career, there's no, you know, you're not a famous scientist. You don't have all these other options. So uh, a grant from a disease organization is usually what gets somebody started in research. And, uh, and that allowed me to get preliminary data. And then I got a grant from the NIH, a five-year grant, to, to basically develop my career. And, and basically, that's how it happened. So, so there's all these mysteries, and, you know, but it's not... You know, it really comes down to opportunities just show themselves. And uh, for Huntington's disease, I think the society does a great job at making those opportunities out there and letting people take advantage of them. And then, and then it leads to other things. So that allowed me to do really interesting things, to work with a lot of Huntington's families. Um, and then uh, I think, as, as Chung Ho mentioned, um, as, and as people here know, one of the big concerns is, as in the late stages of Huntington's disease, how do people get good care? So Ted Bird had started a, had started a clinic um, at, uh, in Middlesex Hospital, which is an old county hospital. Uh, but there he cared for patients um, really meticulously um, in the latest stages of illness. And, and families would actually move from other states to come to Massachusetts just so their loved one could be cared for at Middlesex. Um, now, so Rick, and then, and then there were um, other folks that would be placed in other nursing homes around Massachusetts. And as Chung Ho mentioned, we would go visit the nursing homes and try and give the staff education about Huntington's disease, because as you can imagine, most of the people in the nursing homes have Alzheimer's disease or something like that. And, Huntington's folks are pretty young and they're different, and so doing education, I think, was really, really important. Um, so Rick and I would go out to different nursing homes, and one day we went to one in Lowell, uh, Massachusetts, and um, and the uh, we were doing our usual education. But what was different is the head of the nursing home uh, became really interested in what we were saying, and. Uh, he got so interested that he called us back. We did it a couple more times. And then he said, well, what about making our nursing home a specialty home for Huntington's patients? He said, wow, that would be great if you could do that. Uh, and he did it. So Jim actually turned the Lowell facility in, into pretty much a, 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 well, a very heavy emphasis in Huntington. So, I think when I left there in 2007, so I went there for almost 20 years, um, there I think there were about 44 or 45 Huntington's patients there. And uh, in the good times, he was actually able to hire in people to kind of really experiment and, and try and work with food to make it more uh, appetizing, easy to swallow for folks. They had um, programs to, to really kind of 
get people more engaged, and it was really a quite a quite an atmosphere, and it was, but it was all kind of serendipity, as I mentioned. He just went to an educational program, and and Jim was able to turn return to something to something really special. Um, and then the research really came. A lot of the research came from the patients, so we were working with Jim to try and find the gene, and we found the gene, and then we worked to uh, do the first presymptomatic testing in Huntington's disease, which was really a, a, you know, a brand new thing that no one had done before, to try and talk to families, talk to people who have, are at risk, try and inform them about what the decision process they should be thinking of before they get tested. Uh, for the f and this was for the first time. So it was really, really interesting and, and I think very highly impactful. And then as my, my work in the lab had gone along and I tried to try to figure out how, you know, if these I ideas and theories we had from the animal studies and the cultured neuron studies we were doing, how would we know if they were really true in people? And, uh, and again, it was uh, serendipity. It was... Uh, uh, the fact that I ran into a friend who was out at McLean Hospital and they were doing a new technique which would look at lactate in the brain. And so one of the theories would be that the, in Huntington's disease, the problem is the cells aren't getting enough energy. And when cells don't get enough energy, particularly oxygen through the oxygen pathway for energy formation, they use a lot of glucose and they generate a lot of lactic acid. And, you know, anything you ask, they would do it. Uh, and uh, so we, I, there was one of the ladies, and I said, well, what, what about, would you want to go out and try and see if, you know, you have to lie down in a magnet for probably an hour and try and stay still, um, but if you could do that, it might be helpful, just on chance we could find this. So uh, she said, sure, and so uh, we drove out to McLean, and she went in the scanner, and... Um, and she came out of the scanner, and, uh, and I asked my friend, you know, well, what did you see? And he said, well, the lactate's really, really high. So that was really exciting. That we f it was the first time we had a between what, you know, a theory of what's going on in the brain and, and actually measuring it in the, in the brain of people with Huntington's disease. And, uh, and so we did a whole bunch of studies, and I think that was really a, quite a robust finding of the lactate in the Huntington's patients. And that led us down, now, now the, I guess the, the, the other lesson is that we got really excited that here we had something, we could just test drugs against the lactate, see if we could lower the lactate, and then maybe that the patients would get better. And so that's the next stuff we did. Uh, but the thing is that we never knew where the lactate was coming from. It was a hypothesis. We never actually had a way of going into the brain and figuring out, well, was it really what we thought it was. Was it really this oxygen metabolism problem? Of course, there are other reasons why you could have high lactate, uh, but we didn't really have the ability to do that, and we didn't, and we kind of jumped the gun to try and test things, and we found things. So we found coenzyme Q10 as a drug that would reduce the lactate. Um, that got us real excited, and that got everybody excited, and they went into big clinical trials to test coenzyme Q10 in Huntington's disease. And the first one looked pretty promising, just missed being a, a home run. But then the second one looks like there is no effect. So I guess that's the other story, that um, this is a really hard business about getting treatments out to people. And, and when we do it, we are excited that we have something that we can use now. And so we jump uh, to try and test it in people. Uh, but, but in doing so, there's all these gaps in knowledge. So the lactate's there, but why is it there? Maybe it's not even made by the neurons. Maybe it's made by microglial cells who have nothing to do with, uh, well, I well, can't even say that anymore because now we know more about microglial cells than we did before. But it may, it may not even be a bad thing. It could be a good thing. Um, so those gaps in fundamental knowledge, and the way I think about it is we know something about Huntington's disease and we know where we want to get. We want to make a cure. But the things we know about Huntington's disease are like these stones in the water. And you know, you can see the other side of the water. You can see the land over there, and you can see those stones. But when you start out, you don't know 
how far those stones are apart. And the problem is, if they're really far apart, you're going to end up in the water when you try and do the jumping over those stones to get to the other space. So I think what we need to do, we gotta, you got to take the jumps. Every once in a while, you got to just take a chance that you get lucky. But you also want to fill in the gaps and make those stones closer together because that improves your chances that you're really not going to fall in the water. You actually get to the other side. Um, so I just, I just say that you know, in my office, though I don't see patients anymore, I'm hoping to start seeing hundreds of patients again very shortly, hopefully. Um, but I do mostly email now. Very, very boring. Uh, and you wonder why you're doing it. Uh, uh, but I have pictures in my office, and these are pictures that I have. This, is, um, this guy on the right was, uh, again, a patient who would do anything. He was probably spent more time in the magnet than anybody in the world, uh, getting multiple different tests. And there's a family who, unfortunately, everybody in the family ended up with Huntington's disease. And, and, uh, but but you, know, you don't forget these kind of things. And these are, the, these are the things that really motivate people as they go through their professional careers. So back to NIH. Um, so this is, uh, as I said, we focus across a long spectrum, a wide spectrum of disease, and it goes from basic research to disease-focused research, like on you know, mechanisms that cause Huntington's, to develop therapies by identifying targets for drugs, uh, working on assays where you can test your drugs, um, then go into preclinical tests to see if those drugs are safe and do something in the animal, and then to the point where they can go to the FDA, and then we also fund clinical trials that go out uh, into patients. Of course, the idea is to try to get the patients. That's the main goal. Um, so we support a lot of basic research, and as I said, this is a lot of the filling in the gaps, that usually the problem is that there's so many gaps that you, of, of ignorance, and, uh, and you don't, you, you, you can't get to where you want to get to. The other example is, I remember when the Huntington's disease the gene was discovered, we had this big party in Boston, and um, we really thought that we were going to have a cure within 10 years, but, you know, it's 20, 25 years have passed, and we don't have a cure. So things are hard, and, and one of the things we found is that although we have the gene, and we know what the mutation is, the protein, we don't know what the real culprit is. There's so many, there are so many... Um, potential characters pl into, in playing in how the Huntington mutation causes the disease. We haven't really been able to nail down the one, you know, the smoking gun. Um, the gene itself, you know, that may be the smoking gun. So the interference RNA therapies now to go after, you know, upstream and just get the gene out of the picture. They may, you know, they, they, that's got to be a smoking gun if you can get away with that successfully, this is the question. Um, okay, so this is the problem, and, and you've seen this before, I'm sure. That the problem in Huntington's is that uh, the brain cells are dying over time, and so you can see here the chordate nucleus in a control, and in the patient it gets very, very thin, and other parts of the brain also get thin, but there's that particular uh, affection there. Um, and why does that happen? So at NINDS now, we have about 100 different teams working on Huntington's disease, and they cover a whole range of topics, molecular, cellular pathogenesis, preclinical therapy development, discovery of biomarkers, so that lactic acid in the brain, that was a biomarker, a marker of disease in patients. The purpose of those is that you can test your therapy against a biomarker to know that it's really working uh, before you go into a long five to seven year study in patients. We do clinical research on Huntington's disease, genetic research, work on model systems of Huntington's disease, and then the clinical trials. I would say that besides the point that neuroscience can help us in ways we can't predict, we are not alone in this problem because there are a lot of other diseases caused by mutations that are really the expansion of, of the CAG repeat. So there are other diseases that have the same basic genetic problem as Huntington's. And so clearly you can see that in one, you know, solving one of these diseases um, would, would have a high chance of being very, very important for Huntington's disease because they have the same 
central basic genetic problem underlying them. And we have actually a, almost like a, a virtual pharmaceutical company inside of NINDS now <coughs> where we make available the kind of resources that pharmaceutical companies have. We make them available to researchers in the universities so they can try and develop their ideas into therapies that actually go uh, to the point of the FDA IND and into, and into patients. Uh, we have a program that's set up. Uh, it's centered uh, with 25 centers around the country. It's run by Mara Sikovich, who is very interested in Huntington's disease at Mass General. And this is to test new drugs in people. It's called the Neuronext Network. It's for phase two trials in people. So these are biomarker-informed trials of new drugs. And actually, they are going to be doing, uh, or they started doing a trial in Huntington's patients of a new drug that uh, is, is to try to decrease the irritability problems that many Huntington's patients and their families suffer from. So this, is a, this group is already ready to go. They're very quick at getting things done, so we should get an answer to this question pretty, pretty quickly. Uh, we've done these trials, PREDICT HD and FAROS, um, to try to understand more about the patients who are asymptomatic with Huntington's disease and what's happening to them as they come up to the point of time when they start to develop the first clear symptoms. Really important because in the end, as you'll see, what we'd like to do is get therapies that are, that are targeted on people before they have symptoms and try and prevent the symptoms from coming. So you need to know what that prediction is. You need to be able to predict if I pick, you know, 1,000 people X age with certain CAG repeat, the expectation is, you know, 900 of them will develop symptoms in the next five years. Then if my drug drops it to 500, then I know I have a winner. So these, these studies have been really, really important, and, um, and that data is ready to go we just to be tested once we get to the point uh, that we have something worthwhile. Another big advance has been this uh, technology called IPS technology, induced pluripotent stem cells. So now people can take a skin biopsy and grow those cells into brain cells. So instead of studying the brain cells in a rat, which is what I did, um, who didn't have, even have Huntington's disease, now you can study the brain cells that have been grown up from a person who actually has Huntington's disease and compare that person's cells to their same cells where the Huntington's mutation has been taken out of the, out of the cells. So you can really compare and try and understand exactly what is the Huntington mutation doing to the brain cells. So that's an incredible technology. And we have, and patients have donated samples of their skin, and we have developed them into brain cells, and they're available for scientists to work on. They're in a bank at Rutgers where scientists can get at them. Um, lots of interesting data has been coming out already from, uh, from a lot of the research going on. So this was a project that I worked on a long, long time ago, was trying to find out why certain people with Huntington's get it earlier versus later, and the idea being if you could figure out what made people get it later, then maybe you could turn that into a therapy and maybe everybody would get it later. So I used to comb the country with, and Canada as well, with Rick trying to find really old people with Huntington's disease and how did they get old. And we had a family where no one got Huntington's until they were 70 or 80 years old. So that's almost a cure if you could figure that out. So, in uh, the CAG repeat is certainly a big factor, but the new studies are showing that there's other genes as well um, that, um, that influence uh, whether you get the disease earlier or later independent of your CAG repeat. So, things in addition to the CAG repeat have been found um, that affect the age of onset of the disease. Um, the other, another point to make, uh, which was really interesting, last year we had a, a meeting at the Society for Neuroscience, and uh, one of the Nobel Prize winners, W.E. Morner, came to present his work on Huntington's disease. So we have really, we pulled in a Nobel Prize winning uh, scientist. He, he got the Nobel Prize for developing these unbelievably uh, high resolution microscopes. And uh, what he's studying in Huntington's disease is how the aggregates form and in, and in the early stages 
and how they form these kind of globules that you see in, in the brain cells of people with Huntington's disease. <coughs> but just an example of how the science has progressed to the point where it's pulling in people from all different areas. So he's really a physicist uh, who, who was able to be attracted to study Huntington's disease uh, with his technology. Now, lots of to tools are really important. Uh, in my life, I've always gone from trying to bring new tools to patients, and that's been kind of the, the secret that I've tried to pursue as I went, and uh, so it was uh, the MR spectroscopy I talked to you about, other MRI techniques, and even some stroke techniques. Uh, because what we can do is really very much dependent on the tools that we have to work with. Um, uh, Chung Ho and I work with some really, really smart neurologists. And if we're waiting for smarter neurologists to figure out what they couldn't figure out, it's never going to happen because they were really, really smart. We're just kind of smart, but they're really, really smart. But we have tools that they don't have. That's really the thing. So the tools, I think, is something that's important. And then that brings me to another real big initiative that's coming out of NIH now. It's called the Brain Initiative, and it stands for Brain Research Through Advancing Innovative Neurotechnologies. So this is something that is really quite big. It's got a budget about $150 million a year, and it's to build new technologies that allow us to see inside the brain not just the structure, but actually all the activity and the information processing that's going on in this amazing computer that, that we call the brain. So this is the example that, that uh, I think uh, makes the most to me. So when I was coming out of medical school in 1974, this was the first CT scan. So this was the first time you could see the brain of a living person. And we thought that was really, really cool to actually be able to see the brain. But those pictures were horrible. Look at it, just mush. Remember I told you the chordate nucleus? Well, it's somewhere in here, but good luck finding it. You know, it's, there's no definition whatsoever. But this is what we can do now. This is the magnet at NIH. It's a seven Tesla magnet. And this is the chordate nucleus here, and that's the putamen and the globus pallid. These are the basal ganglia areas. And this, I mean, if you had, if I gave you a slide of brain tissue and put it next to this, you couldn't tell the difference. This is really amazing resolution that we now have the ability to look inside the brain at structure. Um, we're not so good at understanding, of seeing the information transfer that's going on in the brain, uh, but we're getting much, much better at structure. And, uh, and we're hoping that we can kind of get the tools that will allow us to see the information processing too. Because the symptoms that patients have is due to the fact that the neural circuits aren't working. And, um, and that's this flow of information through these circuits. You know, it's disordered, and that's why people have symptoms. If we could get a hold of that, I think we could really, really move further faster. Um, and this is just to, to point that out, that we have in Huntington's disease, we know mutation, we know the pathology, we know some of the biology that's going on inside the cells. And then we know what the patients are suffering from. But what's really happening is that this stuff here, the pathology, is affecting the circuit function, and that's what's causing the symptoms. We yet have no way of measuring the circuit function. Uh, but that's really what we have to get at at some point in time. So, uh, so I must say, just, just, uh, just to give a shout out to CHDI, um, that they have been tremendous partners with us as well uh, in trying to move Huntington's forward. So uh, Robert will tell you more about that. Uh, but but uh, we, we also work very closely with lots of different groups to try and move the research agenda forward. These are just examples of the grants that we fund in Huntington's disease. And the points to make is that there are all different types of topics. There are many different areas across the country. Um, and uh, and and, and, and I think, you know, the, you, don't, you don't know all the names, but these are really strong scientists that have been call, called into Huntington's disease. So I think as a field, we're quite lucky to have really good senior scientists. Now, we have to continue to grow that pipeline because uh, many of them are, you know, they're not spring chickens anymore. Um, and, we, 
And, and the young people are the ones who are going to make the discoveries. I think that they're going to be the ones that have the breakthroughs. So I think we've laid a lot of ground, um, but the new young people are the ones that are going to reap all the benefits. And really, they're going to have the really big party at the end of it uh, when they get a therapy. So this is the five-step path that I think about in Huntington's disease, is to identify the key therapeutic targets. And we have a whole bunch of targets now. That's not the problem. The problem is how do we pursue those to know what's important. We got the next test of therapies in disease animal models to make sure they're safe, to ensure the drug actually gets in the brain, it does what you intend, think it, it should do. And then we need to test it in people with Huntington's disease for safety, but we need good measures in Huntington's patients to say that the drug is actually doing what we hoped it was going to do. And those are these targets, these biomarkers where you give the drug and you think if the drug is working, I'm going to see a change in this biomarker. If it doesn't change, the drug's not working. That's really helpful because that allows you to screen a whole bunch of targets and once you, and then when you see a hit like that, then you can go into the bigger studies uh, where you test to see if it makes people better, slows down progression of disease, and then we would like to go into people who don't even have symptoms yet and see if we can prevent the disease from ever happening. So that's really the goal. That's the holy grail in Huntington's disease. And I think the scientists are really pushing on multiple different, uh, uh, different areas related to these five different steps. And I think we need to fill in the gaps. But if we fill in the gaps and we get a little bit of luck, I think uh, I'm very, very hopeful that we can get something going that's, that's going to be valuable to patients. So I'm going to, oops, I'm going to leave you with a movie. Um, if you guys can get that started, is that possible? If, uh, I don't know if I can. Can you guys in the back start the movie? Oh, OK. So I want to end with the movie because it's just an example of the new technologies that allow you not only to see the brain on MRI scan, but this is actually, it takes out, it makes the brain transparent. So you can actually fly into the brain. Uh, and you can see the structure of the brain, like, you know, it's like those old movies where, you know, the, the, they miniaturized the people and they put them in a little ship and they injected them into the bloodstream and they went into the brain. And, uh, but it's not crazy anymore that you can actually see that kind of detail in a brain. So these new technologies, just this one just came out where you can make the brain, brain transparent so you can then stain and see all the, all the tracks in the brain. So it's uh, like the spaceship enterprise, but instead of going to new planets, it's going into your brain. Um, so, so the advances in neuroscience are really spectacular. Uh, lots of good people are working on them. Even better people are trying to move those from the bench to actually help patients. And the, the work that the society does, the patients, and the, and the doctors, and the scientists, and the nurses, and the industry, pharmaceutical companies uh, together, I think, in Huntington's disease is a, a really close-knit group. And so I have a lot of hope for the future, and I really appreciate all the work that people are doing. So thank you.